Welcome to another episode of What's Next, and we are joined by Phil Anderson, the sales leader for digital business solutions at Datacentrics. Great to have you with us, Phil, and it's great to see you again. How are you doing? Good to see you, Aki. Very well, mate. And you? Yeah, not too bad, considering the heat wave we're experiencing and everything. But listen, it's uh, it's it's a nice problem to have, I suppose. Uh, uh, look, uh, Aki, you're never going to get the British guy complaining about hot weather, mate. Well, exactly. So no. um, I'm not going to go down that road. There's a reason I, I moved out of the UK. Uh, no, no, <laughs> I don't blame you. Sunny weather, it's wonderful. It's great to see you again, Phil. What is the role that you've got at the moment at Datacentrics Digital Business Solutions? What do you guys do there and what are you doing there? Yeah, so... Uh Look, Datacentrics is a well-known uh, systems integrator in the market. Yeah. Uh, and I look after sales and, and our clients for our digital business solutions section of the team. Uh, if I was to kind of classify what we do, uh, very, very simply, we try and help customers improve the experience that they offer to their customers and their employees, mm -hmm. you know, because we strongly believe that the experience that clients have uh, really is what makes them sticky, right, uh, yes. for businesses. And underpinning that, uh, we help clients deliver in a more operationally efficient fashion. So, Phil, talk to me about Datacentrics and the AI journey. How do you at Datacentrics take clients on the journey? What kind of conversations are you having with your clients? So we're working, you know, with many, many clients at the moment on where should they start, right? And, and we use a subscribe to process called Design Thinking. So really, this is an outside-in, human-centric design approach. I think it's pretty well known across a lot of the industry, uh, but maybe not with, uh, with all clients. Mm -hmm. So that allows us really to identify where are the highest points of value for our clients' clients and for our clients' employees, right? Uh, and what is going to move the needle uh, on the actual business KPIs that the business people we work with are measured on. Yeah. So we follow that process and then move very quickly into a technical assessment to understand the the technology on the ground in the client today what can be reused you know uh, what may need repurposing right and then moving very quickly into a some form of minimal viable product there are so many different forms and there are so many different ways this can be deployed in business and this is not new right uh mm. the first neural network algorithms on paper were many 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 years ago in uh, research right yes but what's kind of changed is you know obviously compute you know we now have compute that we never would have had in the past. There's been a hell of a lot of research going on, but obviously the digitization of data in our society is the other thing, mm. right? AI depends on, and particularly what we're seeing in terms of the generative side of AI, you know, it depends on very large data sets and the ability to process and, and compute. Right. So whilst a lot of the techniques and a lot of the algorithms on paper were there, we're now seeing really the democratization of this. And obviously, the public awareness that, that Jack GPT has brought, you know, when you ask people how their kids doing their homework these days, you know, these tools are playing a role, you know, uh, in people's daily lives. So that then brings much more awareness to the possibilities that uh, uh, exist in the enterprise, yeah. right, for business optimization. And of course, that applicability that you talk about with AI, I mean, there's not one size fits all kind of thing, right? So mm. you can use AI for a host of different things, as you mentioned earlier. Look, and, and I think that's that's really the crux of the point, right? Which is, you know, where do you deploy? Where do you spend your money? Where's the highest value uh, from a business perspective? Yeah. And and what can you bring? What sort of new experiences can you bring to your clients? And how can you make your business more efficient? And it's really, that's what we do is try and help clients cut through, uh, cut through that hype curve, really, and try and get to the business value and then go execute with them. So, I mean, Phil, you know, ideally you'd sit down with these executives, right? And everyone's talking AI. Everyone's going, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. But it's got to be strategic, right? And, 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 and how do you deploy AI adoption? You know, what is your advice to executives? So sitting in an organization saying, okay, the board's saying, well, what are we using? What AI are we using? Because here's the reality is that your competitors are – using AI in various applications. So if you don't do it, you're going to be left behind. So what is the approach that executives should be taking when they're adopting this AI strategy? You know, at the end of the day, companies are cost custodians of our personal data yes. as their customers and, and the businesses that they serve. So the first thing you really need to be thinking about is who do you trust with your data? So these these foundational models, as you call them, Right, you know, everybody is familiar with ChatGPT's, you know, large language model and, and has been using it. Uh, 
but I don't think people are really aware that, you know, foundational models are not a one size fits all piece. You know, these are the pre-trained models that underpin all of this wonderful all of these wonderful things that we're seeing. So the first thing is if you're going to take a foundational model and you're going to fine tune it with your own organizational data, right? Your policies, your procedures, your differentiation, right? Who who owns that data? Right? How secure is that data? Mm. Is that data going to be used for other clients? Mm. Right? Uh, is that data going to be used to train the model to give your vendor a, a, an advantage in other areas? So really, you've got to first take a step back and say, okay, how am I going to build this in a trusted fashion? And how am I going to deploy it such that it, it has the right ethical standards? And you know, if you are training that foundational model in a platform, do you still own the uh, the outcome of that training? Now, why are there different foundational models? Right, Let, let's just go into that a little bit. Yes. Uh, I would say it's the difference between if you have a medical problem, uh, you go to a GP, right? So yeah. if you're not feeling well or whatever, you go to a general practitioner, right? And, you know, they have a good breadth of knowledge, right? Uh, you know, but they're not a specialist. And then through that, what you do is the GP identifies where the problem is, and then you may go and see a specialist as a follow-up, right? Okay. So if you look at a model like ChatGPT's model, it's a, it's a generalist model, right? It's, it's summarization, you know, it's, it's consumed the internet, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things you can ask it, but fundamentally it's a generalist. If you really want to change the game with what you're doing in your organization, you want to apply it, let's say, to HR, right? You want to apply it to customer service, right? Uh, you want to apply it to your legal department, right? Every organization is different, right? Every organization has its own policies, its own frameworks, its own needs, right? And that's when you actually would go and ask a specialist. And in order to create a specialist, you've, you, you, you've got to train or tune a foundational model. Okay, so right? there's the difference. That's, that's, it's well explained, actually. Mm. Um, so, so you really need to focus... On, on the core competency of that particular department. So if it's uh, HR, if it's logistics, if it's whatever it is, yeah. you need those data sets specific to that department. Yeah, and, and the ability to fine-tune it with your own data. Correct. As well, right? You know, one organization's HR policy is not the same as another's. Right. So the, the, what's an X platform from IBM, what's an X.ai allows you to bring those foundational models, you know, you can select from IBM's models, you know, you can uh, use models from Hugging Face, uh, that open source repository, that's basically a marketplace for models, uh, right? And then you can bring your own data in to fine tune that, let, right? Let, let's, let's unpack that, that mm. IBM Watson scenario because I find IBM Watson fascinating because I mean, IBM Watson's been around for a long time. Mm. I mean, even before AI became sexy like it is right now. So it's it's long established in the market, lots of innovations, um, and and IBM continually are bringing things to the IBM Watson space. Right? When you look at those innovations, w where is where is IBM going with Watson and with their new innovations? Because I'm hearing fantastic things coming out of IBM's Watson. So look, the one thing with with IBM, they have been looking after clients' data and have been extremely trusted in the market for a long, long, long time. And, and they work to, you know, they have been at the forefront of AI ethics for much longer than we've been talking about ChatGPT, let's be clear. I think, I think one of the first papers I read was way before 2020 from IBM on what is the ethical framework for AI usage, uh, yeah. AI usage right? So I think when you've got a foundation like IBM has in terms of being a leader in, in the build of AI through the years. You know, we go back to, you know, uh, Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov uh, at Jess, right? That, that was amazing, right? But that, that is a long way off where we are today. So that, that, that was really a brute force type algorithm, right? So uh, that looked at every single possibility and chose the best one. You know, we've seen obviously huge innovations from other uh, organizations, but like IBM's always been underpinned by this uh, trusted uh, practices in terms of how they deal with enterprises and how they work with enterprises to make sure they are safe. And that's really embodied in what they've done with Watson X, right? So the goal of Watson X is, is, is to bring the full suite uh, of tools needed for an enterprise to really take advantage of this technology, right? So, and what I mean by the full suite, so three components. Uh, first component, Watson X.ai, right? 
that is the studio. When I talked about bringing models together, that is the studio where you bring the models together, you're training, you're using prompt engineering, you're doing the fine tuning needed to really get to the nub of what's going to be important for that use case, right? Next, the question is, where do you put your data and where and um, how do you source the data, right? And, you know, you, you need not just a warehouse, right, for structured data, you know, you need the ability to capture unstructured data, right? So you need a very flexible, uh, uh, you know, architecture to be able to do that. And that's where what's an X dot data comes in, mm. right? That provides mm. a lake house architecture, right? Which is at the cutting edge of how warehouses and, and reservoirs and lakes and, and, and are designed. And, and so the ability to bring whatever data in that you need to from wherever you need to is really what what's an X dot data gives you. And then the last thing is probably, I think probably the most important component if you look at it from the three, is what's next dot governance, right? So IBM have been you know, one of the leaders in data governance for a long, long time. Uh, and this is bringing all of those types of capabilities uh, to underpin what you need uh, from an AI perspective to stay compliant and to keep up with reg re uh, regulation. And the problem with governance is not having a policy document. That's the easy bit. Uh, the problem is how do you enforce and track and make sure and audit that, that, yes. that you, you know, for your own peace of mind, never mind regulation, that data is being used correctly, right? And it's being used in the fashion it was intended and is being used in a compliant way. So really that's where what's next uh, dot, uh, dot governance comes in. I talked about the trusted element, right? You know, I, I, IBM does not use your data to train other people's models, right? Or to train models for other clients, right? Uh, that's That's not what it does, right? Yeah. IBM works with, you know, and, and, and we on behalf of them work with the enterprise to make sure that we're using the right data for the right thing. So IBM Watson X, um, the way you've explained it, it's certainly the right way for many organizations to look at. If, they, if they're considering doing AI properly and strategically and having the flexibility that you talk about, and those three elements which you touched on, which are incredibly important, uh, IBM Watson X is the platform to go, especially when you look at this market that's very crowded right now and people are looking for something that's going to give them a peace of mind. It all comes down to the ethos in which something is designed, right? And if you look at the IBM ethos of Watson X, you know, the first thing, you know, is open, right? So it's an open architecture, right? They want to be able to bring uh, as many models as possible to that architecture, but do it in a safe and controlled way. So the second uh, design principle, you know, that you can see with IBM is it's not been designed as a consumer platform, right? Yeah. This is not a one size fits all equation. It's been very, very targeted to enable businesses and enterprises, right, uh, to deliver on the types of use cases that, that businesses and enterprise will need. The third thing is, you know, it's been designed to empower value creators of AI. So there's a difference here between consumers mm -hmm. of, uh, of AI, right? So are you just in your organization calling an API, which uses AI to do a specific thing, yeah. right? Or are you as an organization actually empowered to create new ideas and innovate, right? Uh, and that is what the platform is, de is designed for, right? Watson.ai is designed for the value creators in the AI space within your organization, right? And the last thing I come back to, and I come back to it again and again and again, is trusted, right? You know, and, and is that trust in all those ethics? And and we know that the big gen AI models at the moment, yeah, they hallucinate, right? Uh, you know, we've seen that. Yeah. But then you've got the problem of bias, right? Within the data sets that you're using, right? If you look at the way that, the, that regulation and policy is going, right? Uh, you can't regulate AI as a tech, right? No. It's it's almost impossible. That genie is out of the bottle. Where regulation, I believe, is headed is much more targeted in terms of use cases. So how are you using it? What are the outcomes that you're generating with it, right? So, and so you're, what you're seeing is, uh, and I think what you will see is that if you're you know doing something behind the scenes operationally and it, you know it's pretty low impact, there might not be a lot of regulation around that. Yeah. If you're using AI to make a decision around what someone's cancer treatment is. 
Big difference. Totally different question, right? So different levels of regulation will apply for different use cases. In my view, that's that's kind of what we see happening. Because you've stressed the role of ethics in in this whole AI environment, um, and it's still it's still being defined, right? I mean, you hear of these guys appearing in front of the congressional hearings, and um, and, and I guess that governments and 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 businesses and and the people that are developing AI solutions um, are still kind of feeling their way through it, especially when it comes down to ethics. Um, and, and also, th- th- there's the other side of AI, is the AI that we don't know yet the capabilities of. Uh, because where is AI going to be in three years? It's certainly going to yeah. be a lot more powerful than it is today. doesn't mean we've got to readjust governance and ethics and, and all those sort of things going forward. So it's unknown territory. And if you think about what are we doing with AI, right? You know, there's, there's three basic things, right, in terms of, you know, businesses that businesses can do, right? You can gain insight from data, right? That's the first thing. And that's been going on for years and years and years, right? Gaining insight from large data sets that we as humans couldn't necessarily interpret. The second thing that we're doing is we're su- supporting organizations in making decisions using data, mm-hmm. Right. And the third thing is we're actually now into the place where we're actually using AI to automate the tasks and and do the outcomes. So at each of those stages, you really have to be able to trust the foundation that you're building and the data foundation that you're building. So that whole, you know, in terms of your question, Akin, that whole trust and that whole governance piece underpins the entire landscape of how organizations are going to deal with uh, with AI in the future. Phil, it's always good to chat to you. And uh, you always leave me thinking with lots of questions in my mind. But uh, amazing, amazing chat to you. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for your insights. Aki, great chat. Thanks very much. We'll see you again. Thank you. That's Phil Anderson, who is the sales leader for digital business solutions at Datacentrics, talking about AI. And there's lots to think about in what Phil was talking about. But why don't you give Data Centrics a call and find out how they can help you and assist you on your AI journey in your organization? Thank you for joining us for this episode of What's Next.